Steve, it is just great to have you today on this call with our Breathe Parents. You and I have been friends and colleagues in this mental health faith advocacy space for about 10 years. And so it's just been really great to get to know you through that time and uh, be a part of some of the same events and same things matter, I think, to us. But give our audience, if you would, I've already given your formal bio, but if you just tell the audience a little bit, a uh, little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, a little bit, little bit about your family, and then I know you'll tell more of your story and kind of what led you to advocacy. And then we'll, we'll go back and I'll just let you dive into telling more about yourself. Okay. Well, I'm the second of six children. My parents are both pastor, were both pastors. My uncle was a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor. My grandmother was a pastor. Um, you, some of you have heard me say that I come from a family with three different biological disorders of the brain. The first two are easy. One is mental illness. The other one is substance use. And the third is calls to the ministry. Somehow I didn't quite make it. Um, but uh, I, my, since my father was in the army as well, we moved all over, um, Illinois, Maryland, Virginia, Germany, Okinawa, California, North and South. And it was just kind of a, a fact of life that every two or three years we were gonna be moving. In fact, I remember one time when we moved and we discovered that my second to the youngest brother had his suitcase underneath his bed. Oh. Packed because he was afraid one day dad was gonna come home and say, pack up, we're leaving. And he wow. wouldn't have an opportunity to get everything packed that he wanted to have. Wow. I went to a small liberal arts Christian college in Missouri uh, and then came to California to go to seminary and somehow never made it to seminary, but got into education instead. So that's kind wow. of a quick overview. Well, and as in these 10 years that I've known you, I don't recall hearing your family uh, line of pastors and all these relatives in your in your family. No wonder I like you. I was a preacher's kid and I love preacher's kids and no wonder I like you. It makes perfect sense to me now. Well, I, I think I spent a lot of my teenage years trying to uh, uh, make sure that everybody understood that the preacher's kids weren't always the kids doing the right things. You were helping everybody understand that. Much to my father's chagrin, yes. <laughs> I had a brother like that too. Uh, I, I I get this. I get this. I was the good kid, and he was the one that was out there experimenting on everything and uh, doing that same thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'd like my brother, yeah. um, who has since is clean and sober and is doing well. All those things. Yeah. But um, so tell me just briefly, you know, what drew you to advocacy and in mental health? I know that's a part of your larger story, what you're going to tell, but just Kind of briefly and what you're doing now around advocacy well sure um my older brother um started to behave oddly for lack of a better word when he was 17 18 and um ultimately was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder and mental illness is not something we had ever talked about in our family so it was shattering to my parents it was shattering certainly to me um, and, and, and I think it's safe to say that he, he never lived the life that we had all hoped and prayed that he would live and expected him to live. And, um, I, I remember when I was in college and they were in Okinawa, my brother was in Okinawa and I would get these letters from my mother and I, I wish I had saved them, but they would just bring me to tears because what they were going through with John. And uh, it was so uh, uh, just completely unexplainable how my older brother who had always done everything right was now behaving in ways that just, just didn't seem possible. And I can remember one time he called me on the phone and my brother, my brother did not swear ever anything. And he was on the phone with me and I thought, my God, where has he been? I didn't even know you could use those words together. And it was just a torrent of speech. And then, then somehow I ended up in Orange County and so did he. And my parents were back in Indianapolis. And at a certain point, 
they were old enough that as much as they would have liked to be his advocate and supportive of him, they were old enough that it was just too much. And so somehow, uh, and I was the only other family member in Orange County. So it just, it, it, my parents never said, Steve, you've got to take care of your brother. Don't, don't misunderstand. But I felt like I was the one that needed to do it. And, uh, and so I was his primary caregiver, probably, I say caregiver, I wasn't taking care of him and feeding him those kind of things. But when decisions needed to be made about maybe where he was going to live or, or those kind of things, I was his representative payee, so I paid all of his bills. Uh, actually, to be clear, my wife paid all of his bills. But uh, Give credit where credit's due. <laughs> indeed, absolutely. And uh and it just kind of it was a role that I grew into. I suppose I could have walked away from it, but that never occurred to me. Um, and, and and it's because of my brother and the struggle that he had that I got into advocacy because anyone who's been in the system knows that it's tragically flawed. Yes. There are some things that it does a moderately good job of doing. And there are other things like people with serious mental illness, like my brother had, that it, it's really not very effective. And part of it certainly is because of the illness itself. You know, these are not things where, hey, take one of these in the morning and take one at night and you'll be fine. It's yeah. not ever that easy. And uh, so, again, it's a role that I fell into and, and I'm glad that I did. And my brother is now deceased. And. I miss him. Yeah. I miss him. Mental yeah, illness yeah. and all, I miss him. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, you, we've titled this conversation, um, you know, things I wish I had known. And uh, we've, you know, we've talked, you and I've talked before about mental health crises and, you know, what family members can do or can't do or what you wish you had known, you know, all these years that you've been in advocacy and caregiving for your brother and other family members. and. So just talk to us a little bit about about that. What you know, what we can do in a crisis. Things that you wish you had known when your family members, you know, entered into crisis and you were part of it. And uh, yeah, just take some time and and share with us your experiences. Great, thank you. And, and I and I do share my experiences because I think it's it's good for other people to know that they are not alone with this. And normally what happens, since generally we don't talk about it, is when somebody starts to have serious problems, that their initial response is, my God, nobody could possibly understand what I'm going through because this is just unbelievable. And, and when we begin to share and we find out that we're not alone on this journey and that being with someone else who's been down this road before is truly helpful. And, and generally, we don't get that kind of support from the clinical world. We get it from others, again, who have been on the journey with us. The first thing that I'd like to make clear is that I'm not a clinician. I don't have any formal training. Everything I've learned, I learned through the School of Hard Knocks and continue to learn. And I suppose that's the option for all of us, uh, that is, that we continue to learn. Um, and so instead of talking to you from a clinical point of view, I'm going to talk to you from the optics of my granddaughter and my brother, both who had serious mental illness. My brother's was diagnosed as schizoaffective disorder. My granddaughter was bipolar and suicidal ideations and PTSD. And, uh, and in both cases, very, very, very serious. And in, in in my family uh, growing up, we I don't remember ever having a conversation about mental illness or mental health or anything like that. Um, I remember my mother talking about certain uncles or aunts that were eccentric, but that's as close as she would get to saying that they were mentally ill. And I don't know if she didn't have the language to express it. But, but we never talked about so-and-so being psychotic or delusional or anything ever right. close to that. Right. And I can remember my mother once lamenting the fact that, you know, where on earth did this come from? And as I'm sure you know, 
there is a genetic component, but you can have the genetic component and never have mental illness. Right, and on right. the other hand, you don't have any component at all and you do have it. So it's a little bit more complicated than just other members of the family. Um, but, uh, and, and I think that's part of what makes it so difficult to address once you realize that it's happened to your family, of all families, not your family. Uh, you know, you could understand if the people down the street got it, but my God, what else could we have done? And, uh, you know, and, and it gets difficult. And my, my first interaction with my brother when he was psychotic and delusional and all those things was when I was a senior in high school and we shared a bedroom together. And frankly, I didn't care what he thought or said or did. As long as he stayed out of my way, I was perfectly happy. I was a senior in high school. You know, there were more important things than my brother's mental illness. And at that point, I'm not even sure if we were describing it as that. Um, but I, I want to go back to this idea of beginning to normalize behavior. And I've already said that we characterize certain relatives as eccentric and my guess is if we examined that again, we'd say, no, 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 that, that's more like bipolar disorder, or that looks like schizophrenia. But in those days, uh, uh, eccentric was acceptable. And, and then the other, the other thing that I'd like to comment on is that when you have children, may, when husbands or wives have children, I guarantee you, every one of you can tell me how long they were at birth and how much they weighed everyone and most of you can tell me what percentile they were in because we start immediately comparing our children with other children and then there's a period of time between birth and maybe four years of age when they first enter the school system that they're not really interacting too much outside the family it's just just us and it's them and we immediately begin to normalize their behavior because we expect them to be at the very least normal. And so if, if uh, Melissa or if John uh, was interested in certain things, well, that's just the way John is. That's just the way Melissa is. Melissa was in the first grade in Reno, Nevada and didn't have any friends. And we thought, well, it's obvious, you know, she's so bright, she's not going to get along with first graders. So when they moved to Orange County, we said the solution is simple. Skip her through the second grade. Third graders are much more sophisticated and intellectually capable. That's where Melissa wants, should be. So we moved her into the third grade, and she had exactly the same problems. Mm -hmm. And I can remember, and I've told this before, but I can remember dropping Melissa and her sister off for school, and my wife would have them both dressed exactly the same. And Brittany, the second daughter, would kind of trip over the curb running to greet her new best friend. And Melissa would get out of the car and stand between the door of the car and the car itself, straightening herself, you know, so that all the hymns were right. Everything was just perfect. And at the end of the day, Brittany would come back and she looked like hell because <laughs> she'd been playing soccer all day. You know, their stockings were run, her, the hymns were gone in her clothes. I mean, she just looked terrible. And uh, Melissa would come back to the car looking exactly like she did when she got out of the car. And I can remember her saying to me, and I, again, normalizing behavior, she said, Papa, she said, I just don't understand. She said, Melissa, Brittany has more friends than I do, and she doesn't even care, which I suspect was part of the problem. But we normalize that as just Melissa. Yeah. And then she went to another school, and at recess time, she'd go to the principal's office. And the principal's secretary had peppermint patties on her desk. And so Melissa would always open the bowl and have a peppermint patty at recess time. We thought, my wife and I thought, it's wonderful that she has that kind of support from school staff itself. And, and the secretary began to call her peppermint patty. But the reason she went to the principal's office is because she didn't want to interact with the kids on the playground. And we didn't put any of that together. In my brother's case, I can remember having conversations with my brother and also uh, my parents saying that I should never 
allow, they didn't use the word allow, that's a little strong, but I should always walk to and from school with John because inevitably if he were alone, somebody would start picking on him and he'd get in a fight and he always seemed to get the short end of the stick. So if I was with him, either I would engage in the fight or they would leave John alone. And we never put any of that together. And of course, in those days, talking about bullying was not something that was particularly a hot topic. So it was a little bit different. But but the point is, we normalize those behaviors. John has a difficult time making friends. Melissa has a difficult time making friends. School teachers, on the other hand, this, this person who's not clinically trained, at least not certainly in psychology or sociology or anything like that, start to give you feedback about, you know, I'm sitting at one time or another in front of a hundred kids, your son or daughter's age, and there's something going on here. Now they're in no position to uh, diagnose a mental illness. So I don't even want to imply that, but they are in a position to say, you know, back to those percentiles and height and weight and all that, they are here to say, or able to say, there's something going on here. You, you probably should look into it. And that's a perfect question for you to bring up with your family practice doctor or your pediatrician. Now, and they may, they may look back at you and you say, say they think you have a problem because your daughter or your son is perfectly normal. There's nothing here to worry about. But again, it's worth bringing up and asking because one of the points that I really want to make is that mental illness, like cancer, is a progressive disease. If you have someone that you know that's diagnosed with cancer, the first question almost always is, well, what stage is it? And if it's one or two, you think, praise the Lord, there's a lot that can be done. There's all sorts of things that can be done. But if it's a stage four, the conversation is, how can we make this person comfortable in the last days of their life? Mental illness is the same. Now, we, we don't talk about mental illness in terms of stage one, two, three, or four, so I don't even want to apply that. But it is progressive, meaning the sooner it's treated, the better the outcomes are going to be. And of course, that's what we all want. So rather than ignoring it, open the door, find out if there's anything there. And if there is, there's a lot of treatments that are available. And in 2023, we're not talking about frontal lobotomies that leave somebody per permanently right. scarred. We're right. talking about talk therapy. And sometimes we're talking about medication, but there's an awful lot in the mental world, mental health world that has nothing to do with medication. So open the door and find out what kind of options you have, because again, sooner is always better. Some of the signs that we should have looked for in my family is sleep. Anyone that has difficulty sleeping too much or too little or not continuous enough that is a warning sign that something is going on. And again, bring it up with your doctor. Eruptive or explosive displays of anger from a young child. Something is going on. Don't ignore it. Uh, social skills that I've already mentioned. Or isolating. In other words, I don't want to have friends. I just want to stay in my bedroom and do Game Boy or whatever they do these days. Those are not productive. Those are not positive signs. You need to get on top of it. And if all else fails, go to Dr. Google. Not everything on Google is accurate, but it's a nice place to start looking. It's, it's access to materials that when my brother was first starting to have problems, of course, Google didn't exist. And so the only thing you could do is go to a professional. The other point that I want to make, and every time I say this, people are looking around, but one of, out of five people will have a diagnosable mental illness this year. So when I am speaking to a group of three or 400 people, and I say that, everyone is always looking to either side because one of them is going to have a diagnosable mental illness. Yeah. And with COVID, I don't think we've seen the last of that. You know, they yeah, said even... COVID first hit that it was the the earthquake that precedes the the tsunami and exactly. i don't think the tsunami is upon us yet and and i was uh, i was both ha happy and disappointed when recently i think the american medical association decided that women and men 19 years and older should be given some sort of anxiety screening during their annual physical 
I think that's a great idea, but why are we waiting until 19? You know, let's do it in junior high or in elementary school. And, you know, it's all of a couple of minutes to make the initial assessment. Why not ask, find out? Uh, and anxiety is one of the outcomes of COVID as well as depression uh, and, and those kind of things. So, so, so the other thing that I want to say to you is that uh, you, you, and I'm, and now I'm speaking to moms because sadly dads normally check out of this conversation. Uh, when we teach classes, I, and I know I've said this before, the first thing I always do is count how many men are in the room. And then I ask myself, well, what's the percentage of men as opposed to women? Typically, if the room has more than 25% men, it's unusual. Because men have a tendency to create a set checklist to solve the problem. And if it doesn't work, they try another checklist. And if that doesn't work, oftentimes they check out. Mom, you take care of John. I'll bring home the paycheck. Or I'll work with you with the other kids. But, you know, John is, is your deal. And these women come into this class and we started one last Friday night so I'm I'm reminded the women come into the class and they're just faith... tell us what class what class you're talking I'm sorry. about sorry sure family to family it's one of the many classes that NAMI teaches and the women come into the class and their faces are just drawn they look haggard beat up and as the class progresses and it, as you may recall it lasts about nine weeks as the, the weeks unfold, they look, frankly, better and better and better because they're beginning to take care of themselves. And that's the second challenge. The, the, the journey of mental illness is one where you don't really have a clear destination. You don't know what to pack to take along with you. It's you're, you're moving out into the great unknown. And what I do know is that you will do better if you, if you moms, if you take care of yourself, then if you sacrifice yourself to try to take care of the family member living with the mental illness, and that I understand is so difficult to do. But again, we're not talking about he's got measles, he's going to be fine in two or three weeks, typically, we, you know, we're talking about a lifetime. So it's something that you have to prepare for. Uh, and, and if, if, so the analogy that I often use is, as I've already told you, my father was a, a minister and uh, my father, I can remember as a young boy, him saying, you don't ever go to bed at night without a full tank of gas in your car. The point being that somebody could call at two o'clock in the morning and he'd be off to know, no one knows where. And if he, he needed gas, it was a problem. And, and our emotional reserves to deal with a family member with mental illness are exactly the same. And if your tank is not full, moms, you are not ready. And so you have to make it as important to take care of yourself as you make it important to take care of the other members of your family. And oftentimes that's missing. And not unlike somebody living with a mental illness, sleep, is absolutely critical. If you're getting four hours a night, you're cheating yourself. There's no one, they used to say that some people can get by on four hours of sleep. They don't say that too much anymore. You know, seven to eight uh, and, and during stressful times, maybe even nine, but you got to get sleep and it's got to be regular sleep. You've got to get exercise. It can be walking, it can be swimming, it can be uh, the gym, it can be a lot of different things, but you need to be doing something to keep yourself act active. Nutrition is important. I don't pretend to be a nutrition, so I'm not going to tell you anything about that. But you need to be eating well-balanced meals and eating and eating. Mindfulness, your faith is important. Oftentimes, people find the support they need through faith groups. Uh, but you need, you need, you must get into a support group. And I don't mean when I say that, that if, and, and I'm sure many of you know, the Saddleback Church has support groups. NAMI Orange County has support groups. It's more than just attending the support group that you need because anybody can walk through the door and sit there. You need to connect with people in the support group because they will understand the journey that you're on better than anyone else. 
one of one of my favorite stories to to kind of give an example of to that is that I do a lot of hiking in the hills around Laguna Beach. And so this resonated with me. So they, they took a group of hikers and they put them on a trail and in front of them on the trail, there was a mountain. I say a mountain, there was an elevation gain, you know, I don't know, a thousand feet, 1500 feet, something like that. And they asked each of them, so how much elevation gain are we looking at? Now, these were all experienced hikers. And so they had some sense of it and they wrote down a number. Then they took exactly the same people and now they put them with someone else. So now there's two people instead of just one and ask them exactly the same question, you know, come to some agreement on how tall the mountain is and give us a number. And every single time there were two, the mountain was not as tall as when there was one, every single time. And this journey that some of you are already on is exactly the same. It's a journey more easily taken if you're accompanied by somebody else who's been on it before. So you need to find that kind of person in your life that you can talk to, that you can share experiences, that you can hear experiences, because you're going to find out very quickly that because of your experiences, like Kay, like me, you have things to share and you will feel better for sharing them. So I would, uh, the, the other thing that I wanted to say is that one of the problems with, or one of the outcomes of COVID is that we, uh, remember I told you, you need to connect, not just attend. One of the problems with COVID is you get onto the screen and you see somebody you know and you say, hi, how are you doing? And they give you the perfunctory, I'm fine, how are you? And that's not what I'm talking about. When you're live, you know, face to face, you say, hi, how are you doing? They say, fine, how are you? You reach out and touch them. No, 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 really. How are you? Oh. And you're going to get quite a different response. And somehow that doesn't work as well with COVID. And the last thing that I'd like to share is some of you may have heard of a gentleman named Kevin Hines. He tells, uh, for, from my standpoint, a remarkable story. He lives in San Francisco and uh, suicidal ideations on a fairly regular basis. And this has been going on for a long time. And one day he decides tomorrow's the day I'm going to walk out onto the center of the Golden Gate Bridge and I'm going to jump. And so the next day he gets up and he walks across the Golden Gate Bridge and he gets midway and he said, unless somebody stops me, I'm going to jump. So he's got his hand on the rail and suddenly he hears a voice, mister, <laughs> this is only in 2023, right? Mister, can you take my picture? And so he takes a hold of her telephone to take her picture. She says, thank you, and walks away. He turns back to the rail, and he jumps. And I've heard him tell this story more than once. He said, the minute my hands left the rail, I knew I didn't want to do myself in. I didn't want to commit suicide. So he hits the water, and he's fractured a number of bones. And the next thing he knows, there's a white shark circling him. And he's thinking, my God, I'm such, a, I'm such a miserable failure. I can't even kill myself jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. And now I'm going to be eaten by a white shark. And he's told this story many, 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 many times. And after one of his presentations, somebody comes up to him and he says, I was there when you jumped. And it wasn't a white shark. It was a walrus holding you out of the water until the Coast Guard got there. And so he, he's told a story. He probably tells it better than I do, but he's told the story many, many times. And after telling the story, they have kind of a Q&A. And somebody says to him, gee, you sound like such an intelligent, which has nothing to do incidentally with mental illness, but you seem like such an intelligent guy and you're so articulate. Why couldn't you just reach out? And he said, I needed somebody to reach in. And I think that's true for all of us. You know, the perfunctory, I'm fine, how are you? 
you know, when we care about people, it's not acceptable. That's not enough. No, really, tell me, how are you? And uh, if, it, if it wasn't clear before, you know why I've gotten into advocacy. It's, you know, God gives us all gifts and what we decide to do with those gifts is really a choice that we make. And I would never, ever have hoped for my brother or my granddaughter to live with a mental illness. But the question is, so now that you've got it, what do you do with it? And to the extent that I can help other people on this journey and help them understand that the elevation in front of us is not quite as high as what they first thought, you know, that's, that's extremely rewarding to me. So. Thank you, Steve. I, you know, that's very moving. I've heard you talk many times and I'm always touched by the sincerity, the authenticity. Um, you are doing what you do uh, for a very important reason. Uh, like me, there are, there are dear family members that I know you do a lot of your advocacy and work in their, their memory. Uh, and none of us ever want others to suffer or go through, you know, um, what we have or our loved ones to go through what they have gone through. So I appreciate so much all the hours and years of your life that you have been active through NAMI and made such a difference in so many, so many people's uh, world. Um, you know, I, as I was writing down, uh, you know, what you were saying about normalizing and, you know, sometimes I think we use that word can be used both as a, um, can I have you scoot a little closer to your screen? Sure. There you go. Yeah. You were fading into the background there and I want people to see your lovely visage. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, we use that term sometimes in a positive way. Like uh, when we talk about the stigma around mental illness, um, I have used that myself sometimes by saying, when you talk to somebody who has, an, and you put a name and a face and you normalize it, that, that every single person around us, including yourself, could be living with a mental illness. People with mental illness don't necessarily look like this or look like that. And so when we're just saying, this is a normal person. This is the, the person you're in Bible study with. This is the guy that you stood in the line at the grocery store um, and normalizing human beings. And on that side, I think it's really positive. But, you bring up, but you're bringing up a different aspect of it, which I think is a great word, which is that as, as family members or sometimes even with our friends, maybe just to excuse uh, somebody's just a little bit different or that's just hey, you know, we're all individuals. That's the way you do it. This is the way I do it. And we don't necessarily think that there could be a problem. Matthew, um, I've said this many times, he was diagnosed when he was seven with uh, clinical depression, but he had been showing signs of mental illness from the time he was two years old. But I had no idea that children could experience mental illness. So every single symptom or behavior or or action that caused us concern it never occurred to us that it could be mental illness and so that's what i think i'm hearing you say when you talk about normalize is just be aware that someone's quote eccentricities or differences or um behavior that feels outside of maybe what your other kids did or what your grand other grandchildren do or, or your nieces or nephews or whatever it's like take a step back, pause and say, I wonder if what I'm seeing is, um, is maybe related to mental illness rather than normalizing. It's such a catch 22 because we don't want to stigmatize people. We don't no. want to over, over diagnose. Um, we don't want to, you know, we talk a lot about neuro, neurodiversity uh, today is such a, a great word. And so you want to allow for people to be different without it being considered a mental illness but what a great word to as you say just stop and pause and and ask those questions open that door well and you make a good point uh it may be nothing at all so talk to somebody who knows more about it than you do and ask and they may yeah. look you'd say you're overreacting you know this is this is 
kind of pretty routine stuff for a 10 year old. Good, good. But, yeah. but on the other hand, they may say, eh, let, let's, let, let me talk to him or her for a few minutes and see what I think. Um, yeah, I think that I'd rather as a parent or somebody who cares about, you know, my grandchildren or nieces and nephews, I think I'd rather have somebody tell me, no, this is all okay, than to let a, a problem, as you say, develop and get worse before we decide to, oh, we better check this out. We better, yeah, and, we better get then, some help on this. And then looking back saying, Lord, I, I began to see signs seven years ago yeah. and I didn't, didn't respond perhaps the way I should have. Your example of uh, comparing it to cancer and the, like you said, there aren't stages in mental illness in the, that precise way that there are in, in illnesses like cancer, but that's still a very helpful analogy to think of because all of us know somebody who's you know had cancer um, or maybe perhaps had it ourselves and and that staging is so helpful in people knowing what treatments are available you know what you can expect as an outcome how hard the fight might be you know related to that cancer journey and to think of mental illness in a similar fashion is is a powerful way of saying well gosh no none of us want our children our loved ones to be diagnosed at stage four when they are so ill that it's going to be very difficult for them to kind of fight their way back through to any sense of a normal life um but just keep that in mind as better outcomes more typically come with earlier diagnosis and more help that that's a great picture to use yeah, the other thing that I that I wanted to mention is that there's no one listening that doesn't know people living with a mental illness, and you, we, don't have a clue who they are, because they're managing it so well, yes. and seem so productive, or they're so smart, or, or whatever it is, and the idea of mental illness never even crosses our mind, so I don't want to leave people with the perception of, Oh Lord, if you have a mental illness, it's downhill all the way. It's just not. It's just not. There are brilliant people out there living very productive, happy lives that have a diagnosis. And again, we don't have a clue who they are, unless, of course, they share it. Sure. That is a great reminder. Um, your your comments about men, oh, there's so much I could say, but um, not in a pejorative way, not in a mean way or not put down the the men or the dads and for the men and the dads that are on this call right now I'm so grateful for you know your presence I'm so glad that you're here um it's really from our own experience uh with a child with a serious mental illness um we did have to wrestle through that just our personality differences uh Rick so wanted to be able to help you know, he so wanted to do something. He wanted to do something that would make a difference for Matthew. And so all the things that he tried, and he tried so hard to um, let some of his actions make a difference and was frustrated. I've, I've said many times, because Rick has said this about himself, so I'm not saying something he hasn't said. Um, it broke his heart to be an author who wrote a, a book, you know, The Purpose Driven Life, which answers the, you know, tries to answer some of the questions of why on earth am I here? What am I here for? And his own beloved son struggled till the day he died with the why on earth am I here for? What is my purpose? Why do I, be, why am I, why did God put me here? And, and Rick wanting so badly to be able to answer that for his son. And, and not able to, the grief that that caused, the frustration, the helplessness. And I think maybe sometimes, um, maybe some of the dads find themselves in that place of, I tried, I, I, I've done everything I know to do. I'm, I'm, I've given it my, my best interest, my best creativity. I've, I've tried this, I've tried that. And, and if their son or daughter is not responding, you know, in a way that, um, they're still really having a hard time. I know it can lead to that place of just like, okay, you know, I, I don't know what else to do. So I guess you're going to have to handle it. So would you mind just talking a little bit 
more about that maybe to to dads yeah thank you because yeah I, d I don't want to leave anybody with the impression that i don't think dads should be involved and i and i don't want to leave anybody with the impression that their family members will they will do better if dads and moms stay involved and kind of attack this problem if you will together as opposed to one or the other um but i think dads bring an important point of view to the table and i think it's important that again moms and dads work on it together because i think the outcomes will be better uh and as soon as dad checks out if that's what happens uh then it just obviously puts an enormous burden on mom and uh you know you, you have this child together and you should help them live the life that you wanted for them together i think also one of the i can say this for sure in in our family even though rick often felt frustrated that he didn't know how to help matthew he didn't have an answer a solution that made his mental illness go away or even be more manageable what i can tell you is that matthew knew his dad loved him um, by the ways that that rick was engaged and involved and if probably the most powerful thing that any dad could give to his son or his daughter is not that they have an answer but that they show up that they are there to love and to care um, and to grieve together to weep together as father and child over things sometimes that can't don't seem to be able to be fixed but to not feel like i think i just don't think we understand how deeply important it is to just simply love each other with our words with our bodies and hugs with our presence um it may not fix anything but i can tell you for sure that when matthew died he knew his mom and his dad loved him and that is something i'll always be grateful that rick hung in there um, even when he didn't know what to do when he felt very frustrated, when he felt so helpless, uh, he never walked away. And um, there's no way that that could ever be. Um, I couldn't, I love him so much for the ways that he just loved Matthew. So moms and dads, uh, you know, this is a really tender point because we all, moms and dads come to those places sometimes of just feeling, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to make this better. And there is a temptation sometimes to just kind of like walk away if even if not physically emotionally and to i appreciate your encouragement to just stay in there you know stay in there because not only do we need support groups but our loved ones need the kind of um love that says i won't leave you i won't leave you you're not going to walk through this by yourself yep. steve i just can't thank you enough for your time i told you that I was going to end by asking you, um, you know, what are, is there anything that's giving you hope in this sometimes very broken, you know, world of mental health and mental health quote system and lack of system and stuff. And, and um, so I'll give you that chance to, to answer what, is there anything giving you hope or what gives you hope? And I think, I don't even know what I said when you first asked me the question, but, <laughs> but I, I, I always have hope. Yeah. Um, my hope is endless, and some might characterize it as naive, but um, the people that I interact with in the system, I don't ever walk away from those people saying, well, they don't even care. They, you know, What are they doing in this field? The people that I know in the system, and I know a large number, all want the very best for my brother and my granddaughter and for Matthew. I, I never walk away saying they're in the wrong field. They went into the field because they cared. And I think sometimes we're careless in how we respond to them, which I think is a mistake. They're there trying to help us. Um, and, uh, and again, hope springs eternal, uh, certainly for me. Um, and, and I think someday th that these problems will be addressed. Uh, I don't know if I'll be alive when we come to the answers, but uh, again, the, the, the people that I've come to know 
surrounding this conversation about mental illness are remarkable people. Remarkable. Absolutely. I, I wouldn't yeah. trade it for anything. And uh, again, anything that I can do to help move it in the right direction, I'm certainly, I'm certainly interested in doing. So I am. So we're just going to call you. We're going to call you Steve Eternally Hopeful Pittman. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's always good to talk to you. Nice talking with you. Thanks.